David Bonson manages $5 billion of the Bonson Group. has got a new book called Work and the Meaning of Life. It's coming out in early February. He writes a daily column on DividendCafe.com. You see him all over the channel. Uh, he joins us right now. David, welcome. Hey, Brian. How are you? The number one issue uh, in the country is the economy. Number two is now immigration. Um, I just saw the messaging and the message to President Biden. Stop saying things are getting better and are great because – it is turning people off. Why? Yeah, I think that there's a sense in which for middle class voters, they don't want to hear how great things are. They don't feel like things are a lot better. And, of course, at a high level, there's statistical things always that you can say are good, statistical things that are not good. And you can't talk that way. The way I would talk as a finance guy is really bad politically. You know, I can make points that are true empirically, but it's not going to get through to voters. Voters are more emotional. They want to connect with the reality. President Biden does not talk about the economy in a way that makes it sound like he understands what people are going through. Right. He looks at the numbers and said that should be fine. But also, he's never been in the private sector. Well, and a lot of politicians haven't, and there's always a big difference when you haven't been in the private sector and you just simply don't have that connection to what, you know, we call kitchen table issues really are. The market surged this week over news last week about possible rate cuts coming this year, uh, next year. Mm -hmm. I've never, you you do this every day. I've never heard someone forecast rate cuts uh, potentially the way three in a row for next year. The market seems to love that. Austin Goolsby, now with the president of the Chicago Fed Reserve Bank, has a different interpretation. Cut 32. If you look at the employment side of the numbers that you described, They've been extremely strong. If you look at the inflation side, while we have saw improvement in 2023, they haven't been good. We had inflation. We've been dealing with an inflation crisis similar to the crisis facing a lot of the advanced economies. And the only thing I will say is we always cared about consumer sentiment because it was a good leading indicator of actual consumer spending. But over the last 10 years or so, its role as an indicator of consumer spending is kind of broken down. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. for whatever is the reason that's driving that divergence, which has never been bigger between the actual numbers and how people feel. And he listened to the Fed chairman. He went on to say and said, I didn't see any guarantee of cuts. He said, when I listen close, I don't think necessarily cuts are coming. Uh, Goolsby has been calling for cuts or indicating he thought they ought to come uh, for about four months. And that those comments he made after Chairman Powell's press conference were totally against the way Austin himself has been talking. Uh, the rates cuts are coming, and they were fully priced in the market before Powell spoke. The outrageous thing, just in terms of the shock and awe of it, was that he basically just came out and admitted it. And and so the financial markets are leading the way here. They are too tight. They've raised rates too much. They need to come down. Inflation is back down in the 2% range. The only reason it's still showing three is this ridiculous idea that housing prices and rents are still growing at 7 or 8% a year because they're using data from a year ago. The leases that were signed one year ago are showing up in the data now. The fact of the matter is that Chairman Powell let this thing go way too long, and the financial markets are pricing in not three rate cuts. They're pricing in six rate cuts. Were you someone that also thought he waited too long to raise them? Oh, of course he did. And I think that there's no question that going to the 0% level ever is dangerous because it's hard to get off of it. And then what he did that I think was most reckless was told the markets we're going to get up to about 1% or 2% in the next year, and instead he went to 5 So not only did he wait too long, he kind of indicated to markets that they were going to go slowly raising rates and they went very quickly. That's really what hurt some of these regional banks and so forth. It totally froze the housing market. It did. It did. And not just the buyer side, the sell side. You can't sell a house now you have a 3% mortgage on and go buy a house that you can't afford. You, you can do a bigger home. You're ready to upgrade. You've got a nice raise at work. Your family's ready for a bigger, nicer home. But now you're going to have to borrow at 7%. So sellers are frozen and buyers are frozen. So if the, the, if the, the rate comes down, the only reason the rate would come down, of, of David, I don't get my feelings aren't hurt if you want to correct me. But the only reason, the only way rates come down is if they're convinced that inflation has peaked. And um, are you convinced that inflation? Oh, I'm completely convinced inflation has peaked. Inflation was primarily caused because they shut our world down. 
and the world's been reopened and we are producing goods and services again. And so there's been a lot of talk that I've disagreed with from both the right and the left about the cause of the inflation. But the fact of the matter is core goods inflation right now is zero percent. What does that mean? Just the price of goods. Well, core goods, yeah. Yeah, uh, ex- oh. excluding energy. And so you you have um, – A lot of reasons to believe that the inflation issue has come way down, but I don't give the Fed credit for that. But I didn't give them the primary blame to begin with. I think there's all. You don't think they slow down the. You don't think they slow down the economy by raising rates to allow inflation to go down? No, no, no. But see, slowing down the economy is different than inflation. Growth is not inflationary. I like growth. We had really good growth in the 80s and the 90s. We didn't call it inflation. We called it growth. Economic growth is right. wealth creation. It's a good thing. People having jobs, people making money. That's a good thing. But wealth comes from producing more goods and services that enhance the quality of life of a society. That's wealth. And so just simply printing more money isn't wealth. You have to have more goods and services that absorb it. This is Milton Friedman 101 stuff, right? The idea that the Fed needs to slow down economic growth is to me the big misnomer. And really the problem that they have is we don't have enough economic growth. You need more economic growth to produce more goods and services. That's anti-inflationary. But we haven't had 3 to 4% real GDP growth, which we had for 70 years in our country post-World War II. We haven't had it since the financial crisis. So do you think it was political to, to forecast three cuts? Uh, Austin Goolsby says, I, you know, I don't interpret it that way. But having said that, everybody else did. Do you think it's politics? Um, Yes and no. I do not believe that it's crass and sinister and conspiratorial. But I don't think they want to be perceived as having their finger on the scale next year. It would have been very political to not cut rates. I mean, that would basically be uh, damaging the economy unnecessarily. In 2016, they forecast four rate hikes. We were at zero and they didn't raise once. In 72, Arthur Burns clearly helped Richard Nixon with monetary policy. In 94, Greenspan killed Clinton in those midterms, raising rates shockingly, spiked the bond market, and then Gingrich had the huge Republican House takeover in 94. The Fed doesn't want to be perceived as being political that way. So do I think that they said they were going to cut these rates to help Biden? I don't, because here's the thing, Brian, it doesn't make sense. They've hurt Biden all year this year. So how does it help him to all of a sudden say it now but, when they could have helped him eight months ago? But David Bonson, they would they thought they were helping him by trying to tame inflation by raising rates. I don't believe that they believed anything different than I've said, that the inflation was hugely created out of the supply shutdowns of our country and that inflation was then coming the down anyway. the spending that came with it, right? And see, they could have raised rates like they did and stayed at four and a half, four point seven five. 4.75. Inflation still would have come down. Why did they do the extra three quarters of a point after Silicon Valley Bank went down, after First Republic Bank went down, doing more damage to the mortgage market, housing, commercial real estate. To me, they could have theoretically, if they were just being a totally sinister political ally, um, done far more to help. It's too late. That's, this is the way elections work. Biden has no chance of running on a good economic narrative. You remember when George Bush Sr. lost to Bill Clinton in 92? That savings and loan crisis and that recession had been done since the end of 90. But the economy still hung on. Voters are not looking at like how things went the week before the election. Mm-hmm. The narrative of failed Bidenomics is baked in. So we know how this administration hates fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. And they ran on that and they take great pride in that. How do you explain oil production being all time high? Well, because first of all, I don't think they hate I don't think President Biden hates it as much as his administration hates it and the people he has to appease hate it, the far left, AOC, all of those radicals. But I also do think that it isn't the right number. The right we're at all time high of production in terms of an absolute number, but nowhere near an all time high of the ratio of production to consumption. How much oil we need, the demand is so much higher that even though we're producing more, we're not producing as much as we used to relative to the need. So that's the real key number, and we could be. That, that Biden policies are why we're not. Our need or the world's need, because it's a global, it's a global market. It starts right? with our own need. We're not uh, producing enough our own domestic need, and we're failing to meet a world need. It is a global market, and we could be more on the gas side than crude oil. I don't think we're going to be exporting a ton of crude oil anytime soon across the Atlantic Ocean. We could certainly be exporting more to North America. Why, because of the danger? 
Uh, well, they don't need it. They can get it easier and cheaper from Middle Eastern countries. Right. But um, in terms of liquefied natural gas, there's no question. Europe needs it. We've increased the exports there, but we could increase them 10 times more. There's a 1,000% opportunity in liquefied natural gas right. if we have the political will to do it. And we should be build, We should have been building terminals over we, there. And they should be building terminals to receive it. Right. So they underbuilt receiving. We underbuilt sending. And that's something that we could address. And must address. And right. whether it's a Republican or Democrat in the White House, uh, we have to do it. It's a job creator. And you know who did know this? President Obama. He, did, he knew it. He just couldn't talk about it. Because fracking boomed under him and of he course. benefited. Huge. It, he didn't come up with it. He had, he benefited. He had net negative job creation in his administration if it wasn't for fracking. Right. Think about that. It's a monumental. But statistic. he couldn't praise it like right. we would because it's against his base. It's an incredible irony that sometimes things happen that your political uh, forces make you not take credit for. But that's exactly right. And doesn't it burn clean? Well, of course. I mean, it's all relative, right? So does natural gas clean, burn cleaner than coal? Monumentally so. Cleaner than crude oil? Yes. And even the way we burn crude oil has now gotten significantly cleaner. So there's all kinds of technological advancements that are on the right side, but they can't say it because they took a theological opposition to fossil fuel instead of a pragmatic one. Now they're in too deep. Right. Uh, is anybody uh, optimistic about nuclear? Uh, about our ability to build in, in America? No, I'm very optimistic about it in Europe, though. Right. They have more capacity to go quicker. Even though online. they went the other way with Japan, got hit. Yeah. Now they're realizing we got to do something. And France and Germany have them, and particularly France, and they can reactivate much quicker. For us to go get permission to build nuclear, you're talking about a decade or longer. Because I see these stories about these nuclear uh, plants that are so small yeah. and less, you know, doesn't seem as complex as the Three Mile Island version. You know, you know, the world's changed quite a bit, the technology, the capacity. Uh, so you're, we're just going into an all-of-the-above energy world. You're going to have to take that approach. And uh, unfortunately, there's just going to be people on the far left that are going to kick and scream. But reality speaks louder. A couple more minutes uh, with David Bonson in just a moment. And uh, we'll continue to talk about the economy. Bob the Hour, uh, Greg Lukioff, who joined us, uh, the president found, uh, of the Foundation for the Individual Rights and Expression, author of the brand-new book, The Canceling of the American Mind. Brian Kilmeade Show. Educating. Entertaining. Enlightening. You're with Brian Kilmeade. If you're interested in it, Brian's talking about it. You're with Brian Kilmeade. A couple uh, more minutes here with uh, David Bonson. He manages about $5 billion. He's got a new book that's coming out soon. Uh, it is called Work and the Meaning of Life, coming out in early February. What can we expect, David? Uh, with the new book? Yep. Full time, Work and the Meaning of Life. You know, I'm going to go out on the record in this book, Brian, and make the daring claim that work is the solution to our problems, not the cause of our problems. Economically, spiritually, uh, our society is uh, supposedly divided and lonely and alienated. I think a lot of those things are happening. I think they're tragic. I think work produces a purpose because we are made by God to work. And I believe that this uh, argument needs to be remade. Because you believe you can get fulfillment in work. I believe you get purpose. I think that because we were made in the image of God, that we are here to work as he did, and that we can be creative, we can be innovative, and we can serve others. You feel better about yourself when you're actually meeting a need. Right. Nobody will pay you. But if you're, but David, if you had the success you've had and you run the Bonson Group, it's easy to say, no wonder. But what about people out there that were carpenters like, uh, like Jesus? Well, I would make the argument more so for that because what a lot of people don't know when they see me as a wealthy guy managing $5 billion is I started off making sandwiches at a sandwich shop with no parents, with no money, with no place to go in the world, and work was my avenue to a better life and to better um, not only uh, uh, self-worth – but to serving my fellow humanity in a more profound way. People like that are carpenters, those people that become Broadway stars, they started off as busboys. That journey is where we get so much of our fulfillment in life, that earned success. Right, the opportunity. That's what this country gives. I think the journey is more important than the destination. I far enjoyed my path to where I am today that I enjoy where I am today. Because you know it came out good, but you didn't have – what about the stress that you had not knowing if you were going to be, be successful? That stress that you call it, I think you you can also call it uncertainty, risk. 
That's, uh, that's where reward comes from. There is no reward without risk. So I think that we have to hold those things in tension as human beings, that there is an uncertainty. And by the way, I didn't succeed immediately. There were plenty of failures. Success comes later. So through this whole process, this notion of work, I really believe we can have the, the makings of a happy life. Yeah, uh, pre, uh, pre-order it. Uh, so it's going to be great, I am sure. Uh, work and the meaning of life. David Bonson, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. All right, go get some more money. I want $6 billion in you managing my next time you come back. I guarantee it. <laughs> back in a moment. 